Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Alex, for a very kind introduction. My name is David Markham from the University of Atlanta. And uh, it's been an immense pleasure for me to present the first Mayon Chia lecture for uh, this year's ISMOA. Uh, when the organizer reached out to me to, uh, pre to take part for this lecture, I immediately said yes, and this is something that was uh, very dear to me. Um, the topic of this lecture will be about 45 minutes or so, or 50 minutes, is about programmable photonic circuits. But of course, um, I will try to talk um, a bit about uh, the role of, um, uh, it's more the role of Pachia uh, in my uh, career trajectory, uh, and then somehow make a connection towards this burgeoning, very uh, hot field and topic of programmable uh, photonic circuits. So uh, just a bit about myself. Um, I'm working at the University of Trento. So we are uh, in the city of Enschede, which is um, at the eastern part of the Netherlands, very close to the German border. And I'm leading my uh, research group called the Nonlinear Nanophonics Group. So it is just a uh, a few pictures of the entrance of the university. We are part of a MetaPlus Institute that uh, is running a very advanced state of the art uh, nanofabrication facility that we can use here at the University of Trento. Uh, this is just a snapshot of the group uh, during our last uh, um, outing, let's say. And then the group itself consists of uh, five PhD students, uh, a senior researcher, and let's say eight to 10 master and uh, bachelor students and a postdoc. Um, and what are we doing? So my group currently focuses on uh, the interaction of three different ways inside a photonic integrated circuit. So these ways are uh, light at the infrared, and also we are now uh, looking at the visible wavelength, uh, their interactions with uh, radio frequency that uh, carries uh, information. And in this part, we have what is called um, uh, microphotonics. On the other hand, uh, more to the physics side, we are looking at the interaction of uh, high frequency sound waves with this uh, light waves inside this kind of circuit and we call it optomechanics and the kind of applications that we are looking at span from uh, quantum photonics sensing, but also uh, applicable for communications. So this is just showing uh, a typical setup. So we are doing experimental physics and engineering uh, so this is a typical setup that uh, we use to probe this kind of circuits in the lab, right? So there's a lot of optical fibers, uh, components, amplifiers, and also a lot of uh, um, microwave and optical equipment to probe the signals, right? And then here is not even visible. Typically, you have the photonic chip, right? And then the kind of photonic chip that we are looking at um, are shown in these kind of examples. So we are looking at programmable photonics, a topic of this uh, presentation, um, where we have uh, circuits that mimics the circuits in electronics that we can run programs, uh, a single circuit that can be reconfigured to carry out many functions. We are also looking at nonlinear optical interactions, care nonlinearity, uh, inside uh, silicon nitride photonic chips to create lasers um, and also frequency cones. And then the most advanced one that we are looking at, as I mentioned before, is the interaction between uh, surface acoustic wave or bulk acoustic wave with light waves to create advanced lasers and signal processors. So uh, this currently is the state of my group but of course it started uh, from an small, right? So I'm trying to um, uh, make a context here 
uh, I followed the Fed process more in 2001. Uh, I studied physics at the Bandung Institute of Technology uh, from 1998 to, to 2002, so four years bachelor. Um, um, when I was trying to um, uh, come to do my final project, I, I contacted um, uh, Alex and said that oh, I want to join the group. He said, well, I'm not doing theoretical physics anymore. I'm doing photonics, so like optics. And I was like, well, oh, that's cool. And then in fact, that, uh, that was uh, a workshop that was in 2001, uh, to make uh, uh, also connection between a uh, Dutch group at the University of Trento with um, uh, people at ITP. So this is just a snapshot of um, ISMO 2001. Um, uh, so I became um, acquainted with the group via this ISMO as well. Apart from that, I was also doing my final project with uh, Alex, um, and apparently there was a, um, a recommendation for a master study um, at the University of Twente that was available at that time. So these are some of the people that joined the uh, ISMO 2001. Um, this myself. Ari Irman now is a junior group, is a group leader at the Laser Centrum in uh, Dresden. Um, did it, who also got the did it, this year, uh, who also got the recommendation. Um, now uh, is an engineer at IMAC in Leuven. Uh, Hendra is a is a founder of uh, uh, Symmetry Foundation. Um, uh, uh, Pak Marinchan, Pak Henry, um, and of course also Pak Chia. So I, uh, this is one of the uh, the photos or where we had to actually solve some of the problems during the workshop, and then some of us that can that performed actually got the the recommendation to go to the uh, to the Netherlands. So that was really the beginning. It's a life altering experience that we. Um, received. So this is the picture of Pachia and Hugo Huxra. Hugo Huxra became my um, advisor for my master's study. And this Remco Stoffer, who was a PhD student at the uh, Lightweight Devices Group at the University of Twente at that time. Now Remco is an engineer at, at Synopsis and he's actually uh, uh, working with me in a, in a project from the Dutch Research Council right now working with my PhD student. So just faces, uh, these are some of the classmates that I had during the ISMO 2001, and this is where they end up. So indeed, that's what uh, Pachi and Palex did in the ISMO uh, uh, really a career defining trajectory altering um, uh, for, for us. Um, I followed uh, several ISMOAS actually, uh, the first one 2001. Uh, I also followed the next one in 2002. Uh, after I finished my master, I came back to Indonesia and then followed the 2004 edition. And as a PhD student, I presented my work uh, in ISMO 2007. So this was me with Jerry and uh, possibly a future Nobel Prize winner. Uh, um, Professor David Payne from uh, DORC. So the group and Pachia's group uh, was really uh, dear to me. So this uh, photo uh, of a group reunion in Hangalo in 2003, Pachia came to a PhD defense and then we got a chance to uh, meet uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands. And this was a photo of Alex and the other guys. So when I finished my MSc defense in 2003, uh, I got to visit Bandung uh, in 2019 to give a lecture in, uh, uh, at the group. And this was the last time, actually, I, uh, I, 
we managed to um, see and talk to Panjshir. Okay. So as I mentioned before, um, Panjshir has been uh, very influential for us uh, to start our career. Uh, this is an example. So I still have the 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 hard copy of this recommendation letter that Pachia wrote. Typically, Pachia just wrote it with a pencil, handwritten, and then he asked us to type it up and then print it in a in a letterhead of the the physics department. And after that, of course, you still have some um, um, correction from um, Pachia. Um, it's very articulate, it's excellent writer. Uh, and then we learned a lot about how to write it and how to term um, things to uh, articulate. Uh, I put the picture here, it's Professor Sajif John. Uh, the the context is that after I got the the recognition to actually go to the uh, to the Netherlands, I still look around. I was like absolutely in love with photonic crystals at that time. Uh, so I said, I want to go to one of the pioneers of photonic crystal, uh, Sajif John at Toronto. So I asked Pachia to write a recommendation letter. Also, for Alex uh, applied, got the admission, but then didn't get the scholarship. So I think this is also uh, something that is fundamentally different these days. It's very difficult to get scholarships. Uh, I'm happy that these days that people have open their paper to support their uh, studies. Uh, but uh, this was something that was uh, very important in my uh, career path. So um, I ended up at Twente doing my master and PhD. Um, and then after that, I uh, went back to uh, I came to Australia for a for a few years research fellow, uh, and then came back to Twente as a professor. Um, but over that years that I um, I realized that Pachia also opened this uh, opportunity for me to study abroad and then build up my career. It's not only that; huh? it's also the the, the education. So I I came to know about optical waveguides from Pachia and Alex. Uh, this is just a snapshot of a of a, of a of a lecture note from uh, Pachia's uh, um, uh, course uh, classical electrodynamics. And this is this in Indonesia, of course. And this is the uh, one of the snapshots of when he was uh, explaining about optical waveguides, right? Dielectric waveguides, uh, 1D optical waveguides. Um, and then um, I picked that up after that course and worked with uh, Palex uh, in my final project of analyzing uh, optical, 2D optical waveguides uh, via what's so-called effective index method, right? So uh, in this case, a 2D optical waveguide can be uh, solved as, a, as a two parts of 1D optical waveguide where the information of the effective index of the uh, waveguide from, from one dimension is carried over to the, to the second dimension. Uh, and then this just a snapshot of my first uh, conference paper, first expert paper. Actually, Palex was quite, quite kind to put me as a first author, uh, but he wrote the paper and I produced the results for the, uh, for the simulations about coupling between these two optical uh, waveguides, right? So it was new for us, for um, physics student of ITB, of learning about waveguides and et cetera. Uh, it was really exciting. It's something that is I carried uh, over uh, as I'm running my group these days, right? But of course, uh, optical wave type is to form the basis of integrated optics. Integrated optics is not new. So um, this is a, a, a paper from the Bell System Technical Journal by Stuart Miller in 1969. And it's already mapped out 
the vision of integrated optics really clearly at that time. Uh, it had a concept of optical wave type, how to make an optical wave type, and how to make a circuit based on this optical wave type. This is a coupler, directional coupler, and this is like an electron ring resonator, right? So fast forward 50 years or so, more than 50 years, this is the status of uh, optical integration right now. Um, this is, I, I borrowed the slide from one of the uh, experts in the field, uh, Professor, Professor Wim Bogart from the uh, Ghent University and IMEC, and he's showing that uh, now these people can produce this kind of full uh, 300 millimeter wafers full of uh, integrated optical uh, components like light source, uh, optical waveguide, filters, ring filters, uh, modulators, and detectors, and those are interconnected to form this kind of circuit. Right? Um, and then if we go even further about the true um, state of the art integrated photonics right now, it's not only comprising of the photonic circuit, so this is as I've shown you before, this is the kind of atomic circuit. It's, it's now also co-integrated and co-packaged with uh, electronic circuits. This is showing a flip chip, 40 nanometer CMOS electronic chip uh, onto a silicon photonic circuit and some uh, wire bonding to have uh, electrical signal going to the photonic chip. And then the information in the optical domain is sent over uh, long distance with an optical connection uh, using an array of optical fibers. Uh, a different kind of uh, state of the yeah, way of integrating photonic circuits is shown here. This by Ryanix International, which is a spin off company from our university and is one of our largest partners. This showing a photonic circuit in silicon nitride. Silicon nitride is used typically for uh, low loss optical routing and processing. Uh, and this is hybridly integrated with uh, different cir uh, circuits in uh, 3.5, indium phosphide. Because 3.5 uh, semiconductor can be used for optical uh, light generation and uh, detection. So, this is uh, very handy showing uh, the interconnection of these circuits. Uh, but not only that, of course, uh, you need to send signals to the photonic circuit and read the signals back. Uh, so it's also interconnected with um, PCB, electrical PCB, but also uh, radio frequency. So these state of the art photonic integrated circuits. Uh, that can do many applications, including sensing, uh, light sources, computing, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, but then there is a new trend because of this advanced maturing uh, technological um, advancement in integrated optics. Now it is allowed, it is possible to make very high density and very complex photonic circuits that can be programmed, that can be uh, uh, adjusted like uh, uh, electronic circuit, right? So this gives birth to what is called programmable photonics. So what is called programmable photonics? Photonic circuits that can be configured using software to perform different functions. And this is uh, uh, a comparison with uh, electronic circuit, digital circuit, where Field programmable gate array, for example, is consisted of an electrical circuit that is multi-purpose. So depending on the software or the program that is run in the circuit, you can make filters, you can make delay lines, you can make um, um, you can uh, implement computing algorithm and so on and so forth. Right? Um, and this is just showing. Um, um, the necessary technology needed to actually operate this kind of program, uh, photonic circuits as a programmable circuit. So this is just a, 
taken from uh, Wim's uh, recent nature paper about programmable circuits. Uh, and this kind of approach has many, 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 many applications uh, for quantum computing, neuromorphic computing, uh, microphotonic signal processing, and so on and so forth. Right? And so this will be uh, the focus of uh, um, my talk. So if we take a look a bit closer about programmable photonic circuits, there are two types of programmable circuits. The first one is what's called application-specific uh, integrated circuits. And the second one uh, is called um, a general purpose uh, photonic circuit. And so let me explain what I meant by that. So uh, in a more traditional way of making a programmable photonic circuit, people interconnect um, um, dedicated building blocks to form a circuit. For example, you need to split and combine light or to route light you want to make an interferometer that is wavelength dependent, for example, or you can make resonators like ring resonators. Okay. So these are the uh, typical basic building blocks that are used in application specific integrated circuits. And uh, typically the way you do it is that you lay out these components and interconnect them to form a filter, uh, a network and so on and so forth. And then this layout is fabricated via uh, different fabrication process. For example, in silicon nitride devices, you uh, fabricate them via, uh, so you form the layer stack via low pressure uh, chemical vapor dep deposition, for example, or CPD, and then you perform uh, photolithography to create this kind of uh, circuit and then you put metal layers to um, uh, make the, the optical chip uh, tunable, right? So if we take a look at the basic building block a bit closer, uh, one of the key uh, basic building block is the machinder interferometer. So you have a 50-50 directional coupler uh, forming a, a machinder interferometer and then the idea is that if you change the phase of one of the arm of this interferometer, uh, you can actually steer light from 100% to output one to 100% to output two and anything in between, right? Uh, so then you have a tunable splitter that becomes really um, useful to actually uh, reconfigure the pathway of light. So if you now embed this kind of machinder in, uh, interferometer inside a resonator and make an optical ring resonator, you can actually make a tunable filter. So from transmission point of view, if you now change the phase of the light in this uh, straight part or in the, uh, in the, in, in, in the resonator uh, part, uh, you can change the central frequency of the resonance, right? Uh, now, if you can change the amount of light coupled inside the resonator uh, from this box waveguide, you can also change the depth of this filter, right? So you can change the transmission response via these two tunable elements. So uh, how people usually do this kind of tuning, they build a microheater that changes the reflective index via thermo-optic actuation. Uh, it's not the most efficient, it's not the most uh, 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 way, efficient way to do it, but then it's quite convenient because then uh, you can make the heater pretty small and then you can have appreciable effect uh, both in silicon and silicon nitride. So the loss of the wave path is also very important. So in most of our work, we use silicon nitride wave path. Silicon nitride has a reflective index of 1.9 to 2. Uh, and the waveguide is usually surrounded by silicon oxide with an index uh, of 1.5. So the index contrast is medium, uh, but you can have, you can make a, a waveguide that can be curved with a, a radius of around 50 micron or so. And then this is showing that uh, for uh, reasonably uh, good bending radius uh, down to 70 micron, 
uh, the losses of the wave type is dominated not by the bands, but then also by the, the scattering loss inside the wave band. And the scattering loss can be minimized to around 0.1 dB per centimeter, 0.1 to 0.2 dB per centimeter. So uh, we have low loss wave type uh, that can be curved really tight. So in that sense, you can make uh, a high density circuit, right? So this is again uh, uh, showing the, how we operate this kind of high density circuit that can be programmed. Uh, so this is showing the circuit. Uh, this is showing the interface of our program. Let's say the program can be done very simply by the sliders that uh, put voltages inside these microheaters and then that set the refractive index of the waveguide and hence the interference pattern in the resonator or in the machinery interferometer. And this is showing the response of the circuit. For example, this is showing a very deep notch filter from a ring resonator, right? So if you go a bit closer uh, and then you see that this is the kind of circuit uh, where uh, there's a high density of electrical lines going to uh, set the program of the rest uh, of the of the circuit and there is also a coupling between an array of wave type here with an array of optical fiber in the input and output and then the advantage of silicon nitrate is that this kind of coupling from the chip to the fiber can also be made very low loss because then you can tailor the modes of the silicon nitride wave type if you go even closer uh, with microscope, you see that the, the circuit can consist of various resonators where you have this ring resonator and then you have heaters uh, uh, built on top of the, of the wave type. And then each heater is connected to leads. And then these kind of leads will be connected to the power supply that controls the voltages uh, of this heater. So this heater acts like a, like a resistance, a resistive heater. If you put voltages across that, there will be current, current flowing, and there will be heat burned into this uh, heater that eventually changes to the index. Okay, so um, one of the applications for this kind of programmable, uh, programmable photonic chip is what is called microphotonics. So in a very short uh, description microphotonics is the processing of high frequency radio signals, not optical signals, uh, but then done in the optical domain. So there needs to be a stage that converts the radio frequency that is picked up by an antenna for satellite communication or radar or radio communication, put into the optical domain by optical modulation, processed in this reprogram reprogrammable chip, and then the result is uh, detected back uh, into the RF domain via photo detector, right? So this is a burgeoning field. We are um, uh, fortunate to be the uh, an early player and then uh, um, yeah, make some um, uh, contribution to the field. Uh, via these uh, papers that we uh, produce. Uh, what is critical for the for microphotonics is that uh, it needs to be tightly integrated. It needs to uh, have advanced functions, but also high performance. So programmability can help with that. So with, as I mentioned before, we are an early um, uh, adopter of microphotonic systems. So already uh, 10, 11 years ago, uh, we built uh, a, a circuit consisting of ring resonators uh, that is equipped with this kind of heaters. And then we package it. And then we show that these kind of circuits can be programmed for various applications. The same circuit, different programs, right? Uh, the, 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 uh, the chip itself we call a frequency discriminator chip. Uh, and then for uh, example, that if we run one program uh, where we put a phase modulated signal into the photonic chip, 
we can linearize a transfer from the radio frequency to the optics and back, right? So uh, because these are analog signals, linear transfer from the radio to the optical domain and back to the radio domain is very important because then it creates uh, low spurious signal, unwanted signal. And we can show that if we reconfigure this kind of frequency discriminator, we can have a linear transfer function. And um, not going to explain very deeply about this, but then this is a measure of dynamic range. So dynamic range is the range of radio signal that you can accommodate in your system. Uh, ideally, you can accommodate really low signal that is limited by noise and very high signal that is limited by nonlinearity. So, uh, but the same chip, if we program it to accommodate now uh, radio pulses, it behaves differently. So we can run a second program that creates this uh, kind of filter that takes an input Gaussian pulse and then shape it uh, in the in the in the radio frequency domain to fit a certain kind of uh, what is called frequency mask. So this the context in the context of ultra wideband communication, the FCC, for example, uh, set a certain kind of rule that an emission of a radio signal shouldn't uh, go beyond a certain kind of spectral mask. Right, uh, and then to shape a Gaussian pulse to fit the spectral mass is quite difficult, uh, especially at high frequencies. And photonic chip, a programmable photonic chip, we show uh, that we can actually shape these uh, pulses really nicely. That's the second program. And then if you go with the third program, for example, the same chip can be used to actually. Um, recognize an unknown RF frequency. This is very important for radar application. For example, you want to determine whether a certain kind of frequency belongs to uh, something friendly or something that is uh, uh, a threat. So, but then you want to do it really quick over a wide uh, band. Uh, so you don't want to do a dedicated spectrum analysis in the frequency in the in the RF domain that is very narrow band, but you want to do it with optics, right? So this kind of programmable chip actually we show can be used to determine uh, an unknown frequency. So the experiment here is that we put an unknown frequency into our modulator, and then after the programmable chip, we try to get the frequencies, right? And this is showing that if we put one gigahertz, this is what is measured and then we determine a certain kind of error, estimation error of this known frequency. But the system works, and then that was a demonstration of programmable photonics 10 years ago. Uh, and then we now built a new generation of programmable chips with more advanced functionality. Uh, and then the idea is that uh, you want to uh, put this uh, device also to uh, change the type of modulation that you have in your microwave photonic system and then make uh, advanced functions like filters, uh, generate waveforms and linearize uh, optical links, right? So it's, it's more dense, more functionality inside a photonic chip. Um, and then uh, these are recent results from my PhD student, Okidaola. You will see this presentation later at 10 a.m. Uh, or at uh, 2 p.m., 3 p.m. Um, and then the idea is that he makes this kind of advanced photonic chips that can have this kind of modulation transformation, can make advanced filter, both bandpass filter and higher rejection notch filter, and then also ultra linear uh, photonic links. So, um, uh, this is this will be the core of the presentation of hockey, but then I'm just uh, would like to show you our most recent results where he indeed built this modulation transformer and a unique kind of ultra programmable double injection ring resonator and shows that with a simple interconnection of these two basic building blocks, he can make a variety of filters with high performance, right? So, in, uh, uh, if he reconfigure the first part of the circuit, 
uh, you can make a uh, uh, narrow, uh, sorry, a shallow notch filter, enhance the rejection to uh, a factor of 100,000, for example, or make a band pass filter with various uh, shape and response. So this is really exciting, and this is the direction of uh, programmable uh, chips that has never been explored explored before. Okay, so let me spend the next 10 minutes or so uh, to talk about a new type of uh, photonic circuit that has been looked at by uh, various people. Uh, this is a general purpose photonic circuit, so this is really inspired by uh, um, FPGA design in electronic circuits, right? So instead of having this kind of resonators, uh, advanced uh, interferometer splitters, and etc., the variety of basic filter ones, this is only one building block and it repeats, right? So the way you um, arrange this building block determines the way your um, programmability and then capacity of your system. So uh, most common building blocks are this two by two optical gate that can be implemented as a uh, tunable coupler or tunable machinery interferometer. But then the idea is that this uh, two by two gate can be reconfigured as uh, just a bar. So uh, light can just go in the upper waveguide. So if you have uh, input goes to the upper waveguide and lower waveguide, or it can cross, or it can have partial state between the bar and the cross, right? And uh, in fact, this is uh, enough, good enough building blocks to build an entire uh, programmable circuit. So there are two types of uh, programmable circuits that can be looked at when you have this kind of basic building blocks. The first one is a forward only meshes. So you have uh, interconnection of this kind of two by two gate but then light goes only forward. So there is no feedback of light running in this circuit. Um, this has been implemented for various applications, for example, for quantum optical processing, um, and then for even for uh, classical computing, for, for uh, optical neural network, and then uh, recognition of uh, voice and so on and so forth. Uh, this is mainly driven by the group at MIT, Professor Marin Sojacic and Dirk England, um, and it's a burgeoning field in itself. Um, but the second approach is actually to interconnect this kind of two by two gate in a, in a mesh kind of way uh, that is recirculating. So light is allowed to go in this kind of circle, uh, so uh, there is a certain kind of feedback similar to what's happening with the ring resonator. And uh, the, the, this was actually invented by Leming Zhuang, uh, in, uh, which was a former colleague from the University of Santa, and now he's an engineer at IMAC. But then uh, the group that's really showing uh, large-scale implementation of this is a group of Kapmani in Valencia. So, um, and this kind of uh, signal processing is very powerful. An example of uh, application for this is, as I mentioned before, neural networks that needs fast multiplication of large ma matrices. And this even has been um, uh, commercialized by several uh, um, companies, including Light Matter and Light Intelligence. And I think there is also a different company based in Princeton uh, that was actually backed by Bill Gates. So this is something uh, that is uh, quite receiving a lot of attention. Uh, so the, 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 uh, where is this field going? For example, one example is to interconnect uh, the, 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 this kind of meshes these are all linear optics, right? With a non-linear optical element. For example, with a ring resonator that creates optical frequency comb. So an optical frequency comb is a non-linear kernel resonator that is well 
uh, design in terms of its dispersion, such that if you come in with an intense signal frequency light, what you get are pulses. Uh, and if you take a look at the spectrum, you have multiple uh, frequencies or new colors are being generated. And this is a Nobel Prize winning invention that has been used for spectroscopy, for uh, signal processing and so on and so forth. But then there is a group in Munster, for example, in Germany uh, was demonstrating parallel convolutional processing using this kind of interconnection of silicon nitride ring resonator with this kind of uh, meshes, reconfigurable meshes. So uh, this is one of the steps that we are also looking at at our group to combine our expertise in frequency codes with this kind of meshes. Okay, so let me spend the uh, next five minutes or so to give uh, time for five minutes question. Uh, what is needed for the future of programmable photonics, right? Uh, as I mentioned before, what is needed is, uh, is uh, the optical technology to be uh, uh, better, uh, lower loss, for example, but then not only that, you also need to have efficient tuning of the photonic chip and also advanced software to drive the programmability of this photonic chip. Uh, about the tuning itself, it's a big problem right now because then, uh, as you can see, as the circuit gets bigger and bigger, you need more and more heater. And then uh, heater itself has, let's say, has limited uh, kind of speed and the magnitude of the effect is actually quite small. Uh, and the problem is that it burns a lot of power, right? So. Uh, to have uh, this kind of large circuit that can be reprogrammed, we need to shift to a different kind of tuning. People have talked about micro electromechanical tuning, MEMS or NEMS, uh, tuning with liquid crystal uh, cladding, uh, or even to use uh, diode effect in silicon. So this is also something that needs to be addressed properly. And then in terms of application itself, uh, it's important to see what works and what won't work with uh, the, the type of programmable photonics. This is what I meant. So uh, if I plot uh, the configurability and scalability with respect to the performance, and then try to place different type of uh, integrated optical circuits, of course, in the in the in the in the early days in the 1970s or so, you have very simple circuits, traditional optical circuits. They are not programmable and maybe have uh, high loss, right? But then uh, now the, the 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 field has uh, has shifted towards, for example, application specific circuits that have medium re re reconfigurability, but because it's application specific, has very high performance. And this is needed for demanding applications like uh, optical signal processing and so on and so forth. On the other axis is the what I just mentioned is the meshes that make the design of the photonic circuit very simple because then you just need to make this mesh and everything is uh, ruled by the software, right? But then as we see uh, these days that even the programmability is very high the uh, the performance of this kind of general purpose uh, photonic circuit can be quite low. And this is because that uh, to make a certain kind of function, it needs to have larger interconnection of circuits that leads to losses and so on and so forth. So for application that is not super demanding like transceivers in data communication sensing or maybe some computing, this is okay. But we feel that uh, the field needs to go into this uh, quadrant where both the performance and scalability are high. Uh, but then the solution is maybe is the interconnection of some part of application specific circuit with the general purpose circuit. Uh, I've shown the work that we've done here as an example that with this work, we really aim to have high programmability at the same time, it's also high performance. Uh, 
uh, the kind of application that will be served by this kind of new generation of circuit will be uh, demanding RF photonics, quantum computing, LiDAR, and beam steering. So let me conclude my talk. Uh, I talk about uh, programmable photonics. It's a new idea. It's a game changer. It allows photonics to mimic versatility of electronics. But uh, there are still some existing problems that need to be addressed. One of them is performance, but also efficient tuning uh, technologies to actually make this a uh, technology that can be implemented in wider applications. Thank you for your attention.